You're just our hero today, you know. I'm a hero. No, stop it. Just walk 500 kilometers. Of course you are. All I am is sore feet. <laughs> <laughs> gonna go see Dorothy Smith before I started to get uh, advice on blisters and I missed it. So I yeah, got I had some I had some good pointers and I forgot to get those to you. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. Just a case of Next mind time. Over. Let me know when you do it again. Uh, what <laughs> I say or do to ask you to think I'm not stupid. In there the done that got the blisters, I'm done. Neil, did you do it all on one pair of shoes? No, I had three different pairs of shoes, so I rotated them out. If I didn't do that, my feet would be a mess. Not a good idea. Who knew? Well, I did get some some help from some people. But... Okay, so advise me. Is every is everyone here who's going to be here? I think so. Okay. Well, I I suspect we should probably call the meeting to order, unless anyone else is. I'm at a little disadvantage because I'm using an iPhone, so I don't see everybody. I can see four of you, and it seems to change from time to time. So uh, I'll, I'll call on Devlin to, when we do a vote or something, you can you can look at those. Is that okay, Devlin? Yeah, that's just fine, Brian. Great. Okay, well, let's call the meeting to order. And at this point, we we always ask for a disclosure of pecuniary interest and in, uh, under the municipal act i'm assuming that's we just carry on through that there's nobody's speaking up so if no one's speaking up then uh next we will confirm the agenda and again unless it we do it by consensus so if no one has any concerns about the agenda. We'll move on to the minutes. Uh, did anyone want to look at the minutes or discuss any point in the minutes? I think it must have been a lot of people away on spring break or something. That was a was that, was that when spring break was that week? I know I know I was away, so but I wasn't. Okay. Um, Got to go back. To, okay, sorry. I'm just getting used to doing this kind of thing again. I've um, moving on to action items. I don't. I don't see anything in the agenda that refers to any particular action items. So we move on to information items. Go ahead, Brian. Okay. Um, now, is, I, I didn't see if Pat is here. The, the first item is 6.1, which is the Recreation Facility Opening Framework Summary. Yes, thank you, Brian. I'm here. Hello. Good. Okay. Okay. I promise next time I'll have a bigger screen in front of me. Okay. Um, so, actually, uh, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just looking at my big screen here. That's why I'm not looking directly at everybody. Uh, in that package, there is the framework, which the staff are using sort of as our guiding document um, for the openings of the different uh, facilities. But what I wanted to just bring everybody up to speed on the last seven months is how we got to where we are today and where we're headed from here for our community services, parks and recreation facility openings. So COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the community services operations greater probably than any other department in the township um, for a variety of reasons, but most of our services are public facing. Um, there were in stage zero, which you can see as you look across that chart, uh, we were not permitted to open anything except for parks open space. The difficulties we had during that phase was enforcement of the closures of park amenities. So the focus was on communication, signage, and enforcement of those closures. Um, just over 90 staff in the department were placed on designated emergency leave, and staff were moved to work from home. So our facilities and our offices were all closed. And then in May, 
uh, some additional staff were put on designated emergency leave and others uh, were redeployed to work in the parks and we did not hire uh, our summer park students. We used uh, current staff from within our department and uh, it was an interesting summer but they all did a fantastic job learning how to use the mowers and all the equipment and finding their way around to all the 60 parks. So it was a great, uh, great summer. Um, during stage zero, Center Wellington experienced an influx of tourists, uh, especially to Alora. Uh, the natural environment is part of the DNA of Center Wellington, and the core marketing uh, for tourism focuses on that. Um, and since the open spaces were available, the tourists were coming. Our message uh, from the tourism department was to stay home and visit us later. Um, however, this is not what, if anyone was in Alora, this is not what they were experiencing. There was a lot of people coming. The, Indeed. we needed, sorry? Okay. We needed to open public washrooms. Um, and there was no direction or permission from the province to actually, or the health unit to begin opening public washrooms. However, the alternative was not um, something that was uh, an option for us. So we had to work through some decisions and challenges and public health guiding us to get some of our parks washrooms open. In stage one, some outdoor facilities were permitted to open, such as the tennis courts, the outdoor courts, and the skate parks. And the challenge there was really enforcing the user limit so, and the physical distancing. So we had no indoor facilities open at this time. And outdoor facilities started out with only permitting tents. So we had to make sure that facilities like the basketball courts and the skate parks were well signed and uh, we were enforcing this and um, we had a lot, we had some support from the OPP and our bylaw enforcement officer to, to try and help control crowds that were gathering at some of these facilities. In stage two, most of our outdoor facilities could open except for playgrounds. Uh, the splash pad and the indoor and outdoor pools were permitted to open. So the aquatic center opened on August 4th and this was challenging to reimagine these operations due to the proximity of staff to patrons. So if you can imagine, our staff had to be retrained, brought back to work, opened the aquatic center and retrained on how to rescue somebody with, uh, with COVID uh, restrictions and do CPR, how do you do that? So there's a lot of things that had to be considered. Um, however, we were able to open on August 4th and the aquatic center has been open ever since. In stage three, most facilities could open with strict adherence to regulations outlined in provincial documents. And uh, this was with the direction and uh, with the limitations set out by local public health. Um, the greatest challenge throughout this entire time of trying to reopen and reimagine our facilities um, was that the province would announce um, what was allowed to open prior to any consultation or information coming to anyone, even um, public health, they did not know. So there was no released information along with the fact that you could open a pool and then they would not tell you, well, what are the restrictions? What can we do? What can't we do? Um, so it was very challenging to try to navigate that. Meanwhile, the public was anticipating things could open. Um, so uh, an example that we experienced for uh, during the openings was when our sportsplex could open, the limit uh, permitted in there was 50. Yet in that same legislation piece, you can have 50 people in a fitness center, but only 50 people in, in the entire sportsplex. So there's 100,000 square feet for 50 people. And in a fitness center, no more than 50. Um, it, did, it just didn't make sense. So we were not, uh, we were starting to ramp up to open. Then we had to put a hold on that until we got a change in that legislation allowed us to have 50 people in what they call each pod or each area of that building. So within each pod, for example, people cannot cross over. Those on pad A, pad B, um, streetscape, the fitness area, and the aquatic center have to have their own entrances and exits or time delayed entrance and exit, their own washrooms. And, and uh, so it's been an interesting way to think about opening our facilities, but uh, our team has worked very hard and uh, we're getting there. So as facilities were reopened, we were bringing back staff from designated emergency leave with new training, new schedules, and new duties that we've implemented. A lot of cleaning and touch point cleaning and 
things that uh, the, the, the facility is sparkling clean and has never been so clean and sanitized <laughs> over and over again. Uh, the new normal is how we anticipate operating until COVID is no longer a threat. So stage three is pretty much the uh, final stage of the provincial opening. We anticipate a few tweaks along the way. Um, if they make any changes, right now we're on a holding pattern with the province making no further decisions to open anything or change any procedure to open further. Uh, we do have some upcoming openings. So the ICE was, if you look on that chart, the very bottom line tells you what date or which month a uh, facility actually opened. And uh, we, on October 5th, the ICE was open. And uh, this is a significant cross center and a lot of challenges to overcome to get our ice open. But we are open right now in phase one of the ice for all of our minor sports groups. The fitness and weight room, the fitness weight room opened on Monday, October 19th. And the Victoria Park Senior Center will be opening on Monday, October 26th. So those are sort of our final indoor facilities to open. I have to say, they don't look like they did before. Very strict procedures, everybody must register, sign out, all sorts of things like that. But we're excited to be able to get some of these facilities finally operational. Um, we delayed the openings of those two facilities when the numbers in wave two started to increase. And we paused to make sure and got confirmation from public health and from our emergency operations team to make sure that we were still okay to continue with the openings and with all of the procedures we have in place it is safe to open and uh, we are going to proceed with those two dates okay um just so if you're not aware last friday the hot spots in ontario were uh, required to move back to a modified stage two and the threat is that other areas could be moved back to stage two or a modified stage two if the uh, numbers in their region increase so we listen to those numbers every day, and so far Wellington County does not have high numbers, so we're good. We've targeted the theater not to open until March 2021 due to uh, the low numbers of capacity. It's hard to have a show that's profitable or meaningful with only 50 people in the audience. And we have no plans at this time to open the concession. So if you look across the bottom, that's sort of the last few facilities still to be considered. And uh, staff continue to use this framework as a guiding document, and uh, it continues to be modified. The one we have to add now as we're moving into the winter is opening outdoor rinks. So we have to come up with a procedure and policy and everything else to be able to do that. Um, I guess that's it for uh, the facility openings. I'm really happy to answer any questions um, that you may have about uh, the facilities how they're opened, how we got here today, but that's what's been going on. I know I've been forwarding to you the media releases as they have been coming out, and uh, thanks for some of you uh, had some really positive emails back to us, so I thank you for that. Any questions? So I see uh, Neil has his hand up. I'm not sure how we're going to do this. I guess you'll have to permit them to speak Devlin because um, I don't think Brian can see us. Yeah, I can't see us. So we'll yeah, just, just go ahead. So, Pat, a couple of questions. First off, is, is the fitness center in the, the sports park? That is opening on Monday uh, yeah. with reduced numbers, obviously, and such. But, yeah, we are having our first opening of that on Monday. We're starting with a soft launch, so we're sending out social media messages and actually sending a blast email out to all of our current members and users that uh, were put on hold in March, and then we'll be sending it out to the public. Okay, so you're going to allow public access, so if I want to go over and pay whatever the daily rate is, I can go, I go in? And you I can. You have to just go ahead and uh, you have to go into the um, registration software and pre-register for your time and date that you're coming, um, or you can call our office. We're really trying to push people to online, um, and then you fill out that information and you have to have a registered time that we know you're coming. But yes, anyone can pay the drop-in rate or through their membership. And are memberships giving a, giving a priority on those drop-in rates or is it first come, first serve? It is first come, first serve. Okay. And the next question, I don't know whether it would be you or, or Matt answers it. You mentioned that we're opening outdoor rinks in the winter time. Traditionally, those rinks have been work on or they're they're at the whether or not you're you're 
your neighborhood gets a note for rink is dependent on volunteers in the area. Given that COVID is there, given that we have limited access to our indoor arenas, is there any thought been given to having our staff create and flood the rink? Matt, do you want to give that a stab? Yeah, no, I just had to find the mute button. These mute buttons are hard to find. Um, yeah, no, Neil, we're uh, going to put together a protocol on the outdoor rinks. Um, I'm enjoying this beautiful weather, so I'm hoping it, they don't come too soon. But uh, no, we're planning on the next couple weeks to, to throw um, the guideline together. Um, we're hopefully there'll be uh, a bit of um, work between township staff and volunteers. So um, yeah, we're hoping to, uh, to get that done in the next uh, two or three weeks. Okay, it's just, just so you know, I think it, it probably gets support of council on something like that because we want to get as many recreational activities out there as possible. It's been a tough year for everybody. I know that being outside, I mean, that walk for me was really great because I was outside for 27 days and I can't say enough about being out in the fresh air. So if we get outdoor rinks up and get people to replace some of that missing physical activity they had during COVID, that would, that would be all the better. I'm pretty sure you'll get that. But I'd be interested in what the other people in the committee think about that. So, our, shall we move along to uh, to uh, the capital projects update? Unless there are other questions or thoughts. So that would have us go over to Matt. Great, I got a big list here. Just uh, want to welcome everyone back. Um, good to see everybody. It's uh, too bad we can't meet up in person, but uh, hopefully that will happen soon. Um, so, yeah, over the course of the pandemic, it definitely slowed some of our projects uh, down, um, but in some cases. Uh, it helped us with other projects. So, um, some of the um, some of the areas where we typically we wouldn't get to because of a lot of programming, we were able to get some work done. And um, one area in particular was the the pool, um, where we were able to uh, take the water out of the leisure pool and uh, the hot tub, and uh, we were able to do some uh, tile repair and regrouting. So. Um, the entire leisure pool itself was regrouted as, as well as um, the hot tub. And um, about half uh, the pool deck as well got regrouted. Uh, it worked out real well, looks great. Um, also in that time, we were able to redo uh, the men's um, floor, washroom and shower area. So that, that's cleaned that up as well. So it uh, makes life a lot easier to get some of that work done when we're, you're not trying to um, um, do those projects around programming. So that, that, uh, that worked out well. Um, some of the other projects, um, one, one that's in the hopper, we're just, um, we're just fine. We're, we're going to be finishing up a memorandum of understanding with the festival for electrical upgrades in, in uh, the sportsplex. So uh, once that's finalized, we're hoping uh, to have those upgrades um, hopefully started this fall um, and finished up in the spring. Uh, I know um, the festival and uh, the fall fair are pretty excited about uh, getting that, those pro that project done. Uh, the Alora Skate Park, um, you know, we, we chat about that. Uh, there's, we're looking at uh, the mesh has been ordered for that project. I'm hoping, um, hoping to done, be done yet uh, this fall. Um, fine with some of the projects that we're, we're doing it. Um, getting material has been a bit of a challenge. So some of the projects are taking a little longer than what we're hoping for, but um, so that it's, it's nice, it's, it's getting done. Um, another project um, that we benefited um, during the pandemic was just the repairs to the senior center. Um, about a year and a half ago, we had uh, we just put a, a new roof, um, replaced uh, the flat roof um, at the senior center. Um, now we had to go in and just sort of fix damage from, from that water uh, damage and that has all been completed. So 
Um, there's been a lot of drywall work, um, some floor work, painting. Um, so, yeah, so it, it looks brand new. So I, I imagine the seniors will be quite happy and uh, pleased when they get back into the center um, soon. Another uh, project uh, that's just waiting to go, and it, it all depends on our programming, is uh, fully accessible washrooms at the Sportsplex. Um, and that, uh, that's going to take place on Pad B. I, may, I think I may have mentioned it in a previous meeting. Um, but um, just because we're broken, um, we've got everything broken up into pods right now. We need those washrooms. We can't close them down. So once things start to open up again and we can close those washrooms off, we'll uh, get um, three quotes and uh, get that, that project done. Another good news story, the um, Southridge washrooms, uh, they're pretty much completed and they'll be ready to go for next year. The North Carla splash pad in O'Brien Park, it uh, is well underway. I'm not sure if you, uh, if anybody was able to drive by, but um, uh, the splash pad, the concrete's all poured. Uh, the uh, water features are put in. There's a, also a new playground and um, a new washroom uh, that will be opened up for uh, next season. Um, also the design uh, for Four Far Park is underway in, in Fergus. Um, it's, uh, it'll help service that new subdivision uh, just across the road. Um, what else? Sorry, I got a list here. Uh, D, sorry, dehumidifier on pad B um, was replaced. And we also uh, were able to um, get new sand put into our pool filters as well. And uh, one final thing on my list, and Pat, if I've missed something, please jump in. But uh, we've had um, some sidewalk repairs done at the Sportsplex and at uh, the Senior Center. Um, there was a bit of heaving there, so we wanted to uh, fix that up so it was safe for, for people to walk. I think that's my long-winded um, update. Uh, does anybody have any questions at all? Uh, I, I have one question and a comment, if I may. Um, uh, can you explain the electrical upgrades at the Sportsplex? Sure. So um, the, the electrical units that are there now for camping um, and, and, that, and the areas that are used for special events, they're, they're, um, they're probably a little over 20 years old. So a lot of the contacts are just, um, they're starting to fault out. So um, basically they're looking at upgrading um, those services as well as uh, bringing in um, more services for uh, future camping, as well as uh, to help accommodate um, just more power for the in either staging area, um, as well as uh, more lighting. Uh, I know the fall fair, there's, um, there's some concerns about uh, some dark areas and I uh, wanted to light those areas up for safety where right now they would bring in uh, portable lights on generators. Um, okay. So yeah, that's that's sort of basically what, so we're going to fix up what we have and expand as well. Okay, that's great. I, I, I also noticed um, that the little switchback that leads up to the trail on the uh, on the way over to well, sort of the trail where the trail parallels for far. There were improvements made there, and it looks great, and it's easier to use because I use that a lot on my bike. Yeah, and I know I, I sorry, Brian. I, I I believe uh, Public Works was going to put a sidewalk um, along Gazowski as well to make it uh, a little easier and accessible yeah. um, for people to get there. Yeah. Well, it looks like they did it. Perfect. Good. <laughs> Thanks. Any any other questions or comments? I'll just jump right in there. Uh, where are we at? Is, are we still waiting on a decision from council? I can't remember. We had so many arguments on last council meeting um, regarding the floor in the Laura Arena. Are we working on that now, or are we working on that next year? So I'm going to talk about the 2021 proposed capital projects, and I'll. Uh, I can, that's a great segue in. Uh, we'll finish on this item and then I will talk about that uh, in the next item now. Good. Okay, perfect. Any other comments or questions for Matt? Then we might as well 
move along to Pat for the proposed capital projects. Thank you. So if you click on the link, scroll down on your agenda. This attachment A was part of a budget meeting that was uh, presented to Council on October 5th and uh, was adopted in, I guess I would say, in drafts uh, until the final budget is completed in January. Um, I'm just going to go through some of the items in here that are proposed to do in 2021. Um, the information on the cost of the item is under the 2020, 2021 budget column, and the rest of the information explains where the funding source is coming for that project. So under studies, um, in 2021, uh, we plan to update the Cultural Action Plan. It, uh, it was a great plan that was developed, and it was at, at sort of at its end, and uh, we were scheduled to do a reboot of that in uh, 2021. So we will be working with our cultural organizations, and uh, everything, our cultural coordinator will be taking on that, and we will be hiring a consultant to pull that all together. Then uh, if you scroll down, um, you'll see the section titled Parks and Recreation. And this is sort of where our department begins with some other capital projects. And the one uh, Councillor Dunsmore was talking about is first on the list there, the Allura Community Centre Ice Pad Replacement. So this has worked its way up the 10-year forecast for some time, and we're very excited that in 2021, um, we will be replacing the Allura Community Centre floor uh, for the arena, which is more than just the floor. People may not realize all of the cooling system for the arena runs under that floor. And it is at its life's uh, end, beyond its life expectancy, and showing signs of failure. So uh, we need to replace that. And so the intent is to do that uh, immediately after ice is out and hopefully complete that um, by, I think we're saying October, in order to get the ice up and in uh, for next ice season. So um, that is the intended timeline to replace that floor, the cooling system, and uh, move the um, cooling um, refrigeration plant to the far end of the building. So that's included in that $1.3 million budget. That's a significant project, and we're very excited that that is moving forward. It will give another 30 years life to that floor, which is fantastic. Um, if there's any questions about a project, by all means ask. So if I don't hear you put your hand up or your mic on, I'll just keep moving through the projects. Um, Pat, I have a question on that. Um, yep. We spoke uh, quite a bit about applying for some, some funding to upgrade the remainder of the facility for accessibility and other things. Is that still on this part of that proposal or is that on the back burner right now? It is hopeful that we will receive that funding and if we did then the, this project would obviously expand to all of those things on that list. Um, the 1.3 million would be the number of amount of money we would need to match that grant if uh, we do receive, it's the ICIP grant so we're still waiting on that. We have no further information. So we will be marching forward on this project. We cannot wait, and uh, we should be here soon, I would assume, about that grant. Um, so if that happens, obviously we'll, we'll relook at the whole project and, and uh, consult with this committee again. But we, uh, this would be the amount we would need to, for the matching dollars. If you remember, we applied for just under $5 million um, project fund. <coughs> Any other questions on that one? That was a good one, Dean. You have a great memory, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the outdoor basketball multi-use court has been um, something identified in the Parks Rec Master Plan to uh, have one in Fergus. So we have identified the old tennis court area as a place to install an outdoor uh, basketball. We call it a multi-use court because obviously you can play any hard surface sport out there. Uh, Obviously, there'll be basketball nets. You could play um, floor hockey, road hockey, um, and whatever else the kids can come up with on a hard surface. And we have a matching one similar in Allura, uh, next to the Allura Community Center. So that, and also Bissell Park would be another example. So that is uh, coming up this year to install. 
in parks, we have the uh, new BD Hollow Neighborhood Park to be installed in 2021. There is a section of the Trestle Bridge Trail where we have some excessive flooding going on and uh, where it's going into the neighborhood's backyard. So we're going to be doing some ditch improvements there to uh, move that water along. We have uh, park identification, and I'm going to let Dorothy talk about that later in the meeting. She'll explain that project. And uh, we typically put $5,000 a year in that um, budget to continue that project. Um, as we mentioned, FORFAR is uh, a project that was budgeted for in 2020 and in 2021. Um, so we're looking forward to building a new park um, at FORFAR where there's already a washroom now and parking. We are purchasing a new water trailer, and that is the trailer that we uh, use um, in the summer. Every morning, we're out watering all the downtown flowers and plantings, and uh, so those spaces have expanded as we've had growth, so we need a second one to um, keep up with all the watering. And we have a new parks truck coming, and uh, we have 150000 um, in the urban forestry as we do every year. So those are the projects that we're focusing on that are new in 2021. Any uh, questions about any of those? I think Jennifer has her hand up there. Yes, thanks. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, yep. The yep. first... Um, I know that you spoke about the culture action plan update. Would that come back to be reviewed at all, like through this committee as well? That's a great question. So what we'll be doing is putting out a request for proposal to hire a consultant. And part of that consultant's work will be, yes, input from this committee as well as some uh, from the public. Um, whether we have to do that by Zoom or whether we're able to do that in person, but they, uh, part of that entire project will be public engagement and this committee's engagement. And then once we have a draft, just like we did with the Parks and Rec Master Plan, this committee was able to see that before it was finalized to provide last uh, pieces of input to it. Yes. Does that uh, answer your question? Great. Any other questions? Go ahead, Jennifer. Sorry, I have one other question. Um, in terms of the Allura pad replacement, obviously that's great. It's been needed for a long time. If we assume that 2021 um, is a regular year, um, so it looks like that pad would be out from like, we're looking at like April to October. Um, I would think that there's a lot of organizations and associations that are going to be keen to, you know, get back and do the activities and programs that they do, like all the home shows, you have minor sports like lacrosse, uh, junior and the minor teams. Is there a plan to kind of, if like we're, if we're at the luxury of, you know, um, being able to do all these things, like how to uh, allocate those pad times that be high demand? I can speak to this, Matt may want to address it as well. Um, so we haven't done this yet, but our next step is obviously to meet with lacrosse, which are the groups that mostly use the Allura floor. Um, there would be time in Fergus that we would have to move them to in order to allow them to get their um, games and such in. So one step is to meet with lacrosse. Um, and uh, I don't know at this point if I know that uh, we've been talking to some of the event vendors we're not sure where COVID will take us in uh, this spring and summer, um, but we'll be uh, moving those out and finding them other sites if they want to move to Fergus if we can. Matt, do you have any other comments on that? No, I think you covered everything off there, Pat. And, um, yeah, as we move along, we want to start talking to groups sooner than later, obviously, because um, they want to make plans as well, and uh, you know, we want to help them along um, as we move forward with this project. I think in speaking to our facility booking coordinator, our biggest crunch is actually ice time, and there should be um, enough floor time in Fergus 
it won't be maybe the floor time they want. Um, they typically don't use as many weekends and evenings, oh, and, and they're just going to have to uh, adapt for one season. But the end result will be beneficial. Did we lose Brian? I don't see him anymore. I think, I think Dean has his hand up. Um, just speaking to that, would there would there be a scenario where that could be fast forwarded with the facilities not being used to peak capacity at this point during our pandemic? Is that something that it can get through your your budget and be done ahead of schedule to hopefully forecast to sports being back to normal potentially by that point as best case scenario? Instead of like, could that be moved? to earlier in 2021 of a project like that? So the budget this year is going to be delayed and maybe Neil will bring us up to date during the councillor report on that. So we don't anticipate the budget being passed until later in Jan January. Um, then it takes us time to release that RFP but uh, and get it back and then hire a, a general contractor that can do the work. So uh, if it was an opportunity for us to get that floor up earlier and there'd be less interference to hockey and figure skating, then yeah, we would look to that scenario. But um, that would mean that in February, March, we would have to have done a lot of uh, pre-planning and work um, to have that contractor ready to go before April 1st. So the, the, the timing does not look um, favorable to do that, um, but ideally, um, we would want to interfere as least as much as possible. And we haven't hired that contractor yet. Maybe, you know, they can find a different timeline for the project, but we have to wait until the um, consultant is hired and then the tender for the is done for the work, and then we'll see where things go. Um, we may also may, may not have a similar hockey season, um, so maybe the project will move later. So we, these are all conversations we have to have with our uh, user groups for sure. Okay, thanks, Pat. I just thought it'd be worthwhile talking about that with obviously everything's got them on a very much a floating scale on, on every timeline. So, so Yeah, anyways. too bad it didn't, we weren't doing it uh, ready to go this fall, right? Because we probably could have managed uh, with two ice pads easier this season, but unfortunately we couldn't plan the timing of COVID <laughs> to match our, our budget. I think there's a few other people with their hands up. Devlin, can you... Uh, Well, I thought I saw a couple hands like, oh. Go ahead, Neil. So oh, the only question I have, Patrick, and it, it's really hard for you to answer, um, if we get the grant, if that happens to come through in the next month or so, is there an opportunity to expedite the project then? We know that we're getting contributions from the provincial government. If, and it's a big if, we were to receive the funding, you're probably shutting down that facility for a year. Um, to complete all of the project that is in the scope of work. So that's a much bigger conversation and many more groups that will be involved in that conversation. So we prefer not to go down that rabbit hole until uh, if we got the grant. So until we know, we and don't want to... We're a rabbit before we go down. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it, it, I mean, it would be good news and I think that everybody would uh, be excited and willing to work around it. Um, I think that's kind of what Matt and I have chatted about, uh, for sure. So shall we move on to, uh, to Dorothy's uh, presentation, uh, the OLG funding allocation policy and community impact grants? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Pat, were you going to speak to the OLG one, though? Yes. I'm just pulling up my note. Hold on here. Okay. So in your package, you'll see the policy that was shared at the budget meeting on October 5th. And my only purpose of bringing this up to this group is back earlier this year when we were meeting, I mentioned that we would be um, 
bringing back and working with this group on how to allocate the OLG funds. So although um, the amount that's given out and all of that is a final decision of council, council had directed us to come up with a procedure and policy for them to review on the distribution of those funds. That did not take place. COVID sort of jumped, uh, jumped onto everything and uh, unfortunately we could not uh, um, get that project done. So on October 5th, council had a pre-budget meeting and uh, they reviewed, uh, so if you actually scroll down, I'm not sure Devlin if you can share the screen that I'm referencing, but it is the chart um, showing the anticipated amount in 2021 from that uh, report. Is that a yes, Devlin? Okay, he's just gonna share that with everybody who can see their screen. So in that report, you'll see that in 2019, we had a policy that would provide 88% uh, towards township capital, 7% uh, towards economic development, and 5% was the amount going to arts, culture, and heritage. Um, so what the township does is the money that we receive from OLG in 2019 is allocated to spend in 2020. So we don't pre-spend that money, which was a good decision to make because if we project to 2020, um, we're looking at receiving maybe 740,000 instead of 2.7 million, which was what was received in uh, proceeds of 2019. So when we break that down into the percentages and look over to arts and culture heritage, you'll see that the amount that we may anticipate receiving is 37,000 and that's because the um, casino has been closed for many months in 2020. So that's a difference, uh, significant difference from 137,000 which was um, able to be allocated in uh, 20, 2019. Thanks um, Devlin, you can unshare that or whatever. So basically at this point, um, that chart and information on the policy was shared with council. It was a policy for just 2019, and staff have recommended to uh, repeat that policy in 2020 since we didn't get our homework done and uh, able to provide a procedure for allocating the funds. And because it is such a uh, lower year for OLG funding, it, it makes sense just to roll it over and provide us another year to take a look at um, the policy and the allocation. So. Um, there's nothing really at this point for CSAC to um, do or recommend, but I want to just provide you an update on where that is at because I know we talked about it earlier in the year. And uh, we've already heard from some community groups who want to apply for some of that funding, but I believe uh, maybe um, Neil can comment further on this. It's going to be um, uh, dealt with at the council level and um, if we get the green light to consider a procedure for allocation, we would do that over the 2021 year for the following allocation year. Um, so that's sort of where things are at. Neil, I'm not sure if you have anything else to touch in on, on that. No, you covered it quite well. The only thing I'll say is an unusual set of circumstances because of COVID-19 and the lottery, the OLG has been shut down. They just opened, I think, last week or something. So we're not going to get a lot of money from them. We're playing a guessing game now as to what we're going to do. The net impact that you'll see come through with these grants is that we're just, you know, I'm almost of the mind that 2020 didn't exist. It didn't happen. We got nothing. So let's take the projects that we were going to do in 2020 and move them out to 2021. And let's just everybody sit tight until we get the money. Otherwise, if it's a serious project, we'd have to take it on the tax budget and have a tax increase where a lot of people so it's just kind of something we have to sit and, and kind of wade our way through. And, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe people have some pent-up uh, desire to get into the casino. Maybe have to bang up the order and they do the entire year's worth of, of gambling in, in four months. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But we can't rely on that. So I think we're going to have to have discussions at council, what we do, kind of move everything out a year and just let this year be a write-off. Any uh, questions? 
residents for any uh, questions about the OLG grant and the status of it. And uh, if there's nothing, then uh, Brian, you can uh, turn things over to Dorothy. Can I ask a quick one? Um, are those, does that grant come once a year or is it in installments? I believe that it is paid out to finance in quarters. Um, but um, I would have to confirm that for you. Um, but it is calculated quarterly, and I think, you know, other than the first quarter this year, there's really been zero revenue received at this point uh, because of Q2 and Q3 being closed. Indeed. Okay. Thanks. Back, back to Dorothy for the Community Impact Grant Summary. Thanks, Brian. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so, as you know, we went through the process last year of allocating funding to some community groups, and uh, there was 12 successful applicants last year. As a result of our lovely year that we just went through, um, there were some of the groups that were not able to use the funding we gave them, and we currently are sitting at about $12,000 that uh, has not been spent amongst the groups. So we kind of have to make a decision as to how we want to move this forward. Um, right now, there are three particular groups that have not um, spent their funding. And so I we can open it up for discussion. Um, but one of the things that uh, like I think would be a great idea to move this forward is we roll over that funding for 2021 for those same groups. Um, just bear with me, I have to go to another computer screen here. And we're basically, um, the suggestion I have would be, let them roll it over. And if somebody used part of their funding, then we'll roll that over. And then if they want to apply for additional funding, we can let them do that. But it would be what we rolled over less the maximum allowance of $5,000. Do you know what I mean? So for example, the high school got $4,500 from us. They only spent $1,300 on the project so far. So we need to roll over $3,200. And that then opens up the door that they can apply for an additional $1,800 for 2021. I hope that makes sense. Um, but I'm open for discussion. That is my recommendation, what I think we we should do, but it's now up to you folks. Um, it has to come from the committee, the recommendation, not staff. So whatever questions you may have, I'm open. You just can't see me. <laughs> yeah, so any questions? Yeah, I completely agree, Dorothy. I know a part, like, um, and other organizations I'm a part of that, like, we have bursaries and stuff. And that's exactly what we've done. We just kind of rolled everything over to 2021. So I agree with everything you just said there. Great, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Grace? Grace, you're still muted. Okay, I'm mute. You're muted. Not yet. Bottom left corner on your screen. Unless you're on an iPad, it might be somewhere else. Can oh, Carrie right. or Devlin unmute her at all? Or she has to do it. Okay. There, oh, I think there I you are. Yay! <laughs> no, I was just saying I agree. I think that's a good idea to roll it over. It makes sense because people haven't been able to use the money, and it makes sense to be able to apply for a bit more, too. Now, is that something we need to have a motion on? I actually uh, have a motion I wrote um, in hopes that this was the direction we were going to take. I'm happy to read that motion for you if, if you like. And Please then do. forward it to Devlin. So um, I just got to switch screens. One sec. So the motion reads, the Community Services Advisory Committee recommends to Council that the remaining unused funding for the Community Impact Grant application be rolled over to 2021 and it is to be used for the same project as in 2020. Should 
Should the same applicant want to apply for additional funding in 2021, they can also apply, they can only apply for the difference between what they've rolled over to 2021 and the maximum allowance of $5,000. How does that sound? Sounds good. Any discussion about the motion? So the voting might be a little awkward because we can't all see each other. Devlin, do you want to just take a one-by-one head count? We just need a mover and seconder first. Okay. Well, I'll move it. And I'd like to suggest that the only way you vote is if anybody dissents, that's been on you. Sorry, say that again, Neil. The way to do the vote, Brian, is just have anybody who's against the motion speak or unmute themselves and say I'm against it, and then you'll have a little bit quicker. Good point. Yep, that's good enough. Someone second it, please. I saw Jennifer with her hand up as well. Okay. Anyone against the motion? So we would consider it approved? Great. Great. Thank you very much. Devlin, I'll send you that motion in writing. Thank you very much. No problem. If we're through with 6.4, shall we move to 6.5 and back to Dorothy? Okay. I don't have the agenda in front of me, so Devlin, can you just remind me what I'm talking about right now? Well, I can tell you park signage. Yep, park signage. Oh, of course. Sorry. I have two massive computer screens in front of me, and my laptop sits on my windowsill. I'm working from a desk, so you can imagine my workspace right now. So park signage is a capital project that I've been helping Matt along with for the past year, and I sent a sample of what the signage is going to look like. And if anybody's familiar with our wayfinding signage that we've been doing around town, both in Aurora and Fergus, it's really nice brushed metal frames on them versus the stick that some of the signs are being held up with right now. So I have 12 signs that have just come in. They're coming in this week, actually, and there are signs. There are one, two, three, five signs going in Aurora. We have Bissell Park, the Aurora Community Center, Aurora Meadows, Offer Park, and O'Brien Park are all done. We're just waiting to get them installed. And then in Fergus, we've ordered signs for Revel Park, Strathallen Park, Victoria Park, Westminster Park, and Ryan Park. So those are, we've considered, our bigger parks that need the bigger signage done. And then next year, we'll go on to, as Pat mentioned, we have, I believe, $5,000 in capital moving forward every year now. We'll be able to do more signs annually. But this pile of signs, there's 12 in total because I had to order two for Bissell and two for Victoria because they're such large parks. This is an accumulation of two, if not three, years of signage funding. So I got them all done, and then we move forward on to next year. That's my report. Lovely. Thank you. You're welcome. Now we turn to Councillor Dunsmore with an update. Yeah, I don't have too much to update. We haven't, we're in the middle of budget discussions, and we're arguing back and forth about what goes forward and what gets stopped because of COVID. Some of those comments I've made already, it's a process. So we have to balance the money that we've lost, the ability of the taxpayers to pay, and needs. Because at the end of the day, we're legislated to manage assets. Having an asset management plan is the law. So we have to fix roads, and we have to fix sidewalks, and we have to do what we can. I'm sure the provincial government will give us a little bit of leeway once this dust settles and this COVID stuff. So that's the biggest thing we're dealing with right now is working through what we can do and what we can't do. And there's always a huge discussion around that. 
that's kind of where we're at there. We didn't push the budget out in January, and we, and we did that because we need to give staff time to get us the answers to the questions. And the provincial government will have to get the answers to the staff. If you can imagine, you know, Pat started the meeting by saying that the provincial government would make an announcement at 1.30 on a Friday afternoon and tell the entire public, recreational facilities in all townships can be open. And that's the exact same time that Pat and, and Matt and Dorothy found out about it. And I get phone calls from people on the Saturday saying, how come the parks aren't open? How come the rec center isn't open? They announced it yesterday. Well, it doesn't work. <laughs> you got to take time to make that come into play. And, and, now, that was my only complaint with the provincial government through all of this. They make announcements, but they haven't contacted us ahead of time, and we have no idea it's coming. We find out when you find out on CTV. And next thing you know, everybody's screaming that it has to be set up. It's a long time to get, particularly with the protocol, but particularly, you know, trying to keep people safe in the community. Huge cost of that. And so, you know, you can imagine with the budget when you've got money coming from the, the federal and provincial government, where is it going to? What, what strings is it attached to it? And we won't have that figured out for a while. So that's why we all agreed leaving it to January was probably better. That's about all I have from Council. Great. Thanks, Neil. I much appreciate it. Um, this next item, 6.7, the Indoor Turf Facility Subcommittee update. Uh, I'm not sure if anything has happened with that. Is, is Kurt there? I'm sorry, again, I'm, I'm not seeing uh, all the people. I will next time, but. Yes, I'm here. Um, okay. Hi. Uh, I think we could probably uh, use Neil's words and say 2020 didn't happen. Um, <laughs> My guess on that, um, because we were heading towards a feasibility study, and my guess is everything's on hold. Um, and priority-wise, it's, it's it's not up there. Um, am I fairly close on that, Pat? That's exactly it. So, um, yeah, the money is still there, and will be there in 2021. Um, it is still a capital project to get that uh, the feasibility study done. So, not not the building, the feasibility study. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd also like to comment, though, it's it's nice to hear, Neil, that the uh, provincial government, the format in which they uh, drop announcements about parks and rec is the exact same format that they drop it about education, too. So it's good, you know. They're Friday nothing, afternoon. Usually Friday afternoons, too. Yeah, they're nothing if not consistent. But again, <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> Figure it out. Here it is. <laughs> You've got a whole, you got a whole yeah. weekend to do it. I only ever watch the Friday press releases because that's the only time. I don't know why they do it Friday afternoon because it does create a lot of angst for everybody. Um, yeah. I'm sure. I watch them every day. I watch them every day. But, uh, again, I give them credit. I, I think the, the provincial government is doing the best job they can. Nobody has ever gone through this before. So here we are trying to deal with unforeseen circumstances where nobody had any protocols in place to deal with it. You know, they're doing the best they can, so I'll give I'll give them that much. And, uh, can it be improved? Absolutely, and we'll try and do that next time. And in okay. all seriousness, with respect to indoor turf facility, I, I hope to connect soon um, with with Pat and Matt um, when it feels like we can have motivation to uh, get ourselves ready for something like that. And I just know there's so much going on right now in all aspects of our lives that it's just hard to justify the motivation for that and I hope in a couple months we can start doing that again good thanks Kurt much appreciated so staff updates is, is there more that parks and facilities would like to add well I think um, I think everything was summed up like especially in um, Pat's summary um, I just, just wanted to echo, you know, obviously it was a, a different year for staff. Um, a lot of indoor staff um, had the task of, of um, being outside. So they were, um, they were really out of their element. And to be honest, you know, there was um, staff that have been with us 20 plus years, have lived in the area probably 40 plus years. And, um, for me to come in in the morning and 
and sort of watch them figure out where these parks are in Fergus and Elora. I thought it was quite comical. They'd have their cameras out there taking these pictures, and you know, it took a little while. And it's in one sense, it was those our full time guys had a better appreciation for the students that worked for us in the summer. So it's it was nice. It was a good experience in some cases, but it was very interesting. But as far as operations go, I think things went quite well. And throughout the summer, you know, we we had to work with different groups to ensure you know different different events happened from either working with the the BIAs, neighbor woods, different sports groups, and even internally with public works and in other departments. It was nice that everyone rallied together and worked together to make things happen. So with that, I think that's all I want to talk about today. Well, thanks, Matt. I'm sure I'm sure a lot of people at the end of this year are going to be worthy of kudos. It's been quite a quite an experience. So we appreciate what they what they're all doing. I guess, Dorothy, do you want to speak to cultural and special events? Sorry, before we move off of parks and facilities, it's Pat here. I just wanted to also add something I forgot. We forgot in our capital project. And that is that Storybrooke Park is currently under construction. And Grandwood Park, if you remember, Stephen Wright and Wright Haven Homes donated building that park. And it is also currently under construction. So we have three flagship parks under construction right now. And we anticipate opening them in the spring. But they're all looking really good and are on track. So although we were paused for a while during COVID for contractors, those parks have been delivered as promised on time. So we're excited about that. Fantastic. OK, Brian, I'll jump in now to add my update. So as Pat mentioned right at the beginning, tourism has been an interesting summer. We absolutely were not doing anything to market the area because we knew we were trying not to encourage people to come to our lovely town. But they came anyway. We did do a video about now is not the time to visit us later. But they didn't pay attention to that. They came anyway. So but you know what? We worked very hard with the BIAs in implementing road closures so that the people that were coming to town, they were doing it safely through social distancing by having those road closures. And we're extending the road closures in Elora until November the 1st. And in Fergus, we weren't as fortunate with the road closures there. So what we ended up doing was rather than closing St. Andrew Street, we closed the lane and created a picnic area there with picnic tables and umbrellas. And at least people could come downtown, get a takeout order, and go over and sit and have their meal outside. So we worked really hard with both BIAs. We've been working with getting their patios up and running on the weekends. It's been a very big learning experience. But I think we've come out of it well. And I think they're doing well as well. So it's been a crazy summer. Our numbers have been up and down. Anyone that lives in Elora, goes downtown on the weekend, knows that it's been very busy down there on the weekends. We've had a couple weekends where our numbers this year were higher than last year. But our overall numbers have been down over last year for sure. So that's kind of my update for that area. But just to give you a couple of other things that are happening with some of our cultural groups, as we know, a lot of events didn't happen this year. Well, none of them did. And the sad news is the horror Santa Claus parade in Elora has been canceled. But I found out today that Fergus is going to champion on. And they're doing a very modified Santa Claus parade. They're determined to have Santa come to the kids in Fergus. So I 
like I said, I found out today that they're doing, um, they're having a residential parade, which will include a police cruiser, the antique fire truck, and then Santa on the back of a pickup. And that is going to be their parade this year. They're going to stay away from the downtown core and rather go amongst the residential streets and then families can bring their kids out to their driveway to see Santa go by. So it's going to be very different, but the kids, it's, it's about the kids. And I think that they deserve an applause for trying to pull this off. And I think it's great. So that's scheduled for Saturday, um, December. I think it's, it's the first Saturday of December and they're starting at one o'clock and they're hoping to have it all wrapped up by 4 p.m. because they, they plan on hitting every residential street in Fergus that day. So it's kind of cool. And that will be Saturday, December the 5th. That's, I think, everything I had to update on. Any questions? I can help answer. Okay. And Pat, are you handling item 7.3? I would say we have covered everything on 7.3 up to this point, so I have nothing else I to would, add. We'll see I would, uh, can, can I just say as we as we come to the end of the meeting that um, I'm, I'm one citizen that's very impressed with how people have reached out, how people have risen, uh, gone beyond the, you know, raised the bar, uh, including our own councillor Dunsmore for for the thing that he did recently that we're so proud of, but all of the people who work for the municipality have done amazing things. Um, the, the closing of the streets was brilliant. Uh, as someone who frequents this, the main street of Alora, uh, it, it certainly made things easier and was it was great. So I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed and I'm sure everyone else in the group who's been involved in doing some of those things, but also just as as citizens are pretty excited about what's gone on. So it's been a crazy year, but uh, as usual, the good stuff rises to the top. So anyway, uh, I am assuming the next meeting, November 18th, is going to be a, a, a virtual meeting. Um, that's not going to change for a while. I can, I, I, can I say that safely? Or is that in... If I could just, uh, I'm not sure, Devlin, if you want to handle the item for uh, next meetings. I know we had a chat a bit about this, or do you want me to take it, it on? Go ahead, Pat. I can jump in if you need me. Okay. So I guess I just wanted to reach out to this team and um, look at uh, the date that we hold our meetings. So what ends up happening is we hold our meetings the second Wednesday uh, in November. And we would like to consider changing that to the first Wednesday um, in the month. Sorry, the first Wednesday of the month. Uh, what ends up happening, if you look at a calendar, we have our Committee of the Whole meeting, which is on the um, second last Monday of the month. I hope I got that right, Carrie. That's how we count the weeks. And uh, if we hold our um, CSAC meetings on the second Wednesday, the, typically what happens is most of our agenda reports for the Committee of the Whole are due the same day as our CSAC meetings. So the recommendations you're making here are always a scramble to try to um, add to the agenda. Um, and Carrie will tell you, Pat, it's not Wednesday, they're actually due the Monday before, but I never get my game until the Wednesday. <laughs> However, I'm asking that we could move these uh, meetings to the first Wednesday of the month. And I'm not sure, Carrie, if that has to if that can happen right away or it has to happen in the new year based on uh, pre-published agenda dates. But uh, if this group is okay with that, we would keep the time the same, just change the Wednesday um, to the first Wednesday of the month. That would allow staff to uh, take recommendations from this committee, um, insert them into council reports for council's consideration at Committee of the Whole. Um, we're trying as a municipality to bring all the reports to Committee of the Whole for uh, thorough discussion, which is what's supposed to happen, and then with final approval of those at the final council meeting of the month. So I'm asking that. Devlin, I'm not sure if we want to go around the table and just get a, a verbal okay or not, but Carrie, can you comment for Devlin whether that can start in November or whether we would start that um, 
in the new year. Pat, can I jump in real quick first? Um, I don't think we can do it in November because Kim and I have the first CIA ATM that night. Karen will be involved in that as well. I November know. Sorry. Sorry. I do know that the second Wednesday of November is November 11th, which could also be a stat holiday for some. We have the current meeting on the 18th. We've moved it. Oh, oh for that perfect. Reason. Sorry, I missed that. No problem. So we can keep the 18th as our next meeting and then um, look forward in December. So that we would suggest is December 2nd. Is that right, Devlin? Yep. Be the next meeting. And in January, it would be the 6th. And then every first. Um, Wednesday of each month in the new year. If everyone's agreeable. If that doesn't work for people, um, we agree to second Wednesday, but from a reporting perspective, it would help us to move it one week earlier. We need to go around the table. Or we'll, we'll follow Neil's advice, and uh, if anyone has a, a problem with that first Wednesday of the month, please speak up. So it sounds like generally we're okay with that. So do we need to do we need a motion for that, or can we just is this by consensus? Well, that can just be direction to staff, Brian. Then we'll we won't change the calendar necessarily for December, but we'll we'll give we'll give proper notice, and then um, the 2021 calendar will reflect it. Super. Okay, so if there's no further business, then uh, can we move to adjourn? And I'll have to be frank, I don't remember if we have to have a motion to adjourn or can we just, <laughs> if no one objects, then we consider it, it adjourned? No okay. one objects, let's go home. Yep. Everyone's uh, nodding. We are home, we are home. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Thanks, if no one I can pour a Scott. How about that? Is that better? <laughs> Sounds good. Nice to see everybody. Yes. Well, Thanks, some of everyone. you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.